over the years, different shifts in technology not only make their way to the set, they also change the production process forever. The next technological shift on the set is the cloud. And that means having a solid internet connection is going to become the most important role. And with that comes new training and best practices and standards and expectations. Now, creating an on-set stable network is one of the first essential things to enabling a camera to cloud workflow. And it's not difficult to do once you know how. So today we are excited to welcome a friend of Frame.io and production networking expert, Willis Chung, to help demystify this process. Willis is a DIT, a producer, and a member of the International Cinematographers Guild Local 600. His company, Sclera Digital, is the cinema equipment rental company he created to provide workflow solutions for reliable, bonded cellular Wi-Fi for encrypted video stream monitoring. So let's welcome Willis. Thanks, Michael. Thank you for being here. So, you know, the first thing is tell us a little bit about why it's so important to have a healthy onset network, not just for camera to cloud, but for everything in production. Well, the first thing to establish is that onset networking currently exists from cameras to lights, your VTR operator, local streams, everything's there already. Now, to provide data internet connectivity to it, it allows the existing network to be able to take it online so you can upload your dailies, you're able to live stream, and you're able to download data as far as like watching the live stream on set. So tell us a little bit about the difference between routers and hotspots and modems and, and, and sort of what those nomenclature means. Well, modems and routers, they work hand in hand. Different devices connect to the routers to be able to be in the same network. Now, modems, they provide the internet connectivity. So if you provide internet into the router, it takes everything online. So let's talk a little bit about some of our setups here. So we can start small. So we'll work our way over sure. to our, our setup here. And you know, here we have um, uh, the beginning of this process. Like if we're thinking about what's the easiest way to get going, tell us a little bit about what we're looking at here. This is an AT&T MR5100 5G hotspot. It's something available in the market. And what this is, it's a single SIM direct connection hotspot. And how that's different than a bonded modem is that this one connects directly to the tower and provides internet to the clients. Now, in some cases, you get faster speeds because it's a direct connection. But if you go into a different location or take 10 steps you know, back or something like that, sometimes a Verizon signal or T-Mobile signal might give you something stronger and so that's where bonded really comes to play here. You have the benefit of having two, four, even eight cellular connections all working together. But it's not that simple because there is a cloud network that has a, a software that merges all those carriers together. It generates a little bit of latency. You're not getting a one-to-one -one ratio where, let's say if you have four 10 megabit per second speed carriers, it's not gonna be 40. It kind of all averages out a little bit. And based on a product like this, tell us the difference between strength and quality okay. of signal. Or sometimes when you're at a stadium, a trade show, or just an event where you have a lot of people get together and they're all connecting to certain towers that are around that area. Sometimes you might have really good cell signal, but for some odd reason, your data is super slow or just doesn't work at all. So that's when you have low quality, high signal. And so it's options that we need to kind of factor in to where we are and the environments and all those things. But speaking of environments, let's look at some of the configurations and we can move over here and tell us what we're looking at in terms of this configuration. This is a mobile configuration, perfect for documentaries or people that just don't want to be tethered in any way. So if you take off the modem there, that's, ex that's basically the modem. It could be battery powered. It's using stock antennas right here. The moment you put it on, you just attach your ethernet cable and you're online. So this works when you have an IP-based camera such as this Red Weapon Helium. And once you take it online, you actually have the ability to remote control this camera from anywhere in the world. So we're not just talking about capturing a clip on a Teradek Cube 665 and going right to Frame.io. We're, we're actually transmitting that through the modem right here. And is this also an option where you can have bonded versus a single modem with this. Yeah, so all bonded modems have the ability to not bond and just function as a single cellular modem. So we can kind of use different configurations, but this is going to be great for people that don't want an umbilical and want to be able to be very, very free 
and still shoot and transmit right to the cloud, which is pretty powerful. And then tell us a little bit about the carriers, because if we're capturing all this data and we got to put it somewhere, we're going to get billed for that. So how do we learn <laughs> about how to be prepared to get our uh, accounts set up to make that possible? So there are multiple carrier options, right? For one, we're in the US, it's AT&T, T-Mobile, and Verizon. So you can go direct to carrier, and there are those plans available, some more expensive, some are cheaper. You got the hotspot plans. You have different priorities from government, enterprise, business, to consumers. Depending on what kind of account you are, they'll set your priorities when the networks are congested. And sometimes they come out with a limited plan for X amount of time. If it works for data connectivity, then you gotta snatch it because sometimes they just disappear. Now there's also the other option of MVNOs and those are third party companies that is like a reseller, such as Minted, TrackPhone, and they have some plans that work well but as a third party, you're getting lower priorities over the direct to carriers. The last kind is IoT, where you're always getting the highest priority under the government level, but you pay dollars per gig, and that gets you the highest priority, and depending on how much data you use, you just pay as much as you need. So what you're telling us is that the plan has as much variation as the actual types of modems that are using. So different modems, different plans, different data you know, limitations and throttling. So it, it, it actually pays to actually have that IoT option if you want the most flexibility and the most performance. You'll, you'll sort of enter yourself into a situation where you might have the best situation with something uh, in an IoT plan. Yeah, basically you can have the best equipment out there, but with a really limited plan, there's not much you can do. Right. Now we've talked about our, our, our hotspots, we've talked about our modems, we've talked about our plans. So now we talk about these little things here and we can move to our last component here, which is the idea of antennas. And so take us a little bit through the story of the antenna, because I think that's something that is easily overlooked when we're planning for onset networking. Yeah, so same thing as what I said earlier about the equipment, you can have the best modem and the best plan, but with a low powered antenna at a remote location, you're not gonna be able to get any signal. So let's start with this little guy. This is a Verizon MiFi 7730L. This is a very common hotspot used for the Verizon network. And it's got a built-in antenna and it's great. It's Cat9 modem, and it also has little TS9 external ports on the bottom for you to be able to connect to larger antennas. Now, the stock antennas are usually about 2.5 dBi which in most cases, they work well, right? Now, again, if you're in remote areas or just areas where you need a little more horsepower, this is the mushroom antenna. And it peaks at about four dBi, so that's about double what this is capable of. And you're still able to be very remote. You just put it on a, a stand and off you go. Especially with like two cubes on it, you're able to land straight into the cube if you want a hard line or use Wi-Fi you're able to power your camera to cloud wirelessly. So for a lot of major metropolitan cities, this is gonna probably get you through a lot of it. But people are probably asking, what if I'm shooting way out in random remote areas? What options do we have there? If you need the extra horsepower, then that's when these larger antennas come to play. Now, it's worth noting that all, that this antenna, as well as the mushroom antenna, are omnidirectional antennas. So it gives you 360 degrees field of view. Now. There's also this guy right here. This guy peaks at about seven dBi, so it's almost double what the mushroom antenna is capable of. With an omnidirectional antenna, although it's 360 degrees, it's not gonna give you the range of what this guy is able to. Now this is a directional Yagi antenna, it's a pair. So you're able to target certain towers that have available bandwidth and you can actually lock on certain bands to be able to guarantee you a higher speed. So what about when users are online and they have this type of technology? It also opens up an opportunity for you to talk to the devices because if people are saying I'm having trouble or I'm concerned or there's something not working, you don't have to physically be present to identify where the problem might be. Yeah, the benefit of having VPN routers are not only that you can control the cameras and the equipment locally using VLAN, but also you have the ability to troubleshoot. So if this thing goes out on a job and say AT&T and Verizon aren't working at the moment, 
I have the ability to remote in to the device from wherever I am in my bedroom and swap those SIM cards virtually from AT&T Verizon to like T-Mobile or something like that. And when that doesn't work, then you get creative and figure out which towers are around the areas and which bands are not congested through software such as CellMapper. And from there, you use these guys right here to just band lock them to specific towers. And so you're connected to certain frequencies that have higher data rate. So when we're talking about remote solutions, this isn't just all magic. So tell us kind of summarize for us like your approach philosophically for how to make this successful. Thank you for noting that. Yes, you're right. Having all this technology here does not mean that you have a magic box. When you're six levels underground in a parking lot, this thing is not gonna give you any signal. But again, you gotta get creative in these situations where if you're gonna be underground and you need internet connectivity, then you stick this upstairs in the first level and you can plug an ethernet all the way down. And if you need longer lengths, you could go fiber. If you're in remote locations where there's absolutely no cellular towers around for miles and miles, there is the option for satellite. And we're seeing that technology, which is somewhat fresh today, exploding. We see that market is really getting exciting. Yeah, it's currently 2021. We got cellular towers literally everywhere. And we are seeing 5G develop and Starlink develop as well. So more and more, like these things are going to be more accessible, economical, and it's just gonna be part of the normal workflow. I mean, that's what we're really excited about. And so I wanna thank you, Willis, for joining us today and, and teaching us a little bit about this because you know, a decade ago when digital cameras took over, new roles were created. Everyone was getting a digital education and sort of a crash course into it. And similarly, the set net is a new area that is ripe for development. So we encourage you to dig into this and explore this exciting new territory for production because that tends to lead us into the next few episodes where we're gonna talk about how to take our set net and how to use it to authenticate our cloud-enabled devices directly into Frame.io.